Okay, so today I'm going to go ahead and show you all on how to do a deboot strap installation of Deb1 Linux. It's essentially Debian, but without systemd. So I'm guessing a lot of you guys that got brought to this video, you're probably doing a, a Google on it. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first things first, you want to go ahead and uh, download Deb1. You can get that in the link at the bottom of the news banner. And I'll just give you a quick rundown on how to get there real quick, too. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a Google page here. And just type in download Dev1 Linux minimal live and enter. And click on the first link. It should be the first one. If it's not, you might have to dig around a little bit. And you click on the one of the HTTPS mirrors. And then you're gonna go ahead and go into Chimera. Click Minimal Live. And Chimera 4.0 MD64 Minimal Live. And you're gonna to to go ahead and download this one. Right here. So this would be it. Just this one right here. Anyway, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and walk you all through the process in one of my virtual machines. So open up my vert manager here. So you can see I already got Windows 10 going. And I'm about to fire up Dev1 right now. Now, I already have the Dev1 ISO as inserted hardware right here. And I have a virtual disk right here. So let's go ahead and fire that up. And if you're wondering all this stuff is, this is obviously HTOP right here. I just think it looks pretty, so I like to run it over there. See what everything's going on. Right now, I'm currently virtualizing like two OSs. And then I'm running my main Dev1 Linux. I just transferred over from Gentoo. I got tired of waiting until my next birthday for everything to compile. And I don't have like a pair of epics on hand so I don't have to wait all day. Although I will say again too is definitely a much better distribution. In general, I think it's probably the best Linux distribution. That's just my opinion though. Okay, so we booted into the minimal live ISO. So whenever you're doing a deboot strap installation you're essentially installing the OS in a manual manner, as opposed to uh, using like uh, installation ISO. So if you wanna do more customized stuff with like your BTRFS setup or uh, maybe another RAID software you're using, or you wanna partition things a certain way and you don't wanna use the GUI, or maybe you want to do it while you're already running Linux, and maybe you want to uh, do a deboot strap installation in a folder, ch root into it, and then shut down your current kernel and boot a new kernel without rebooting, which you can do with deboot strapping. So there's a lot of advantages to deboot strapping, especially if you want to get a, a bare minimal installation to work with. Uh, so in my opinion, this would probably be the most quote unquote professional way to install a lot of linux distributions just straight from the cli complete custom uh, no rebooting required if you're already running an os stuff i don't know if i'd say it's a professional way it's just another method so uh first thing i'm going to go ahead and do here is i'm going to configure my network because when you boot the minimal live iso you're not going to have any networking off the bat so i'm going to go ahead and do an f disk dash dash list just to confirm that the hard drives there and everything okay there's that virtual hard drive and then I'm gonna go ahead and do a 
I have config. Uh, actually, it's do I have config dash a. So do an I have config dash a. We'll see. Hey, you know the kernel's got the built-in drivers for what I need. I don't have to worry about any of that right now. So we're good there. Then what I'm going to go ahead and do is since I'm seeing F0 right now, I know that's my networking adapter. So I'm going to go ahead and do uh, sudo nano e etc net uh, networks. You know, tab it out, whatever, and then. Uh, uh, network oh network I'm sorry not networks and then interfaces and then just to get that adapter online I'm going to go ahead and do auto at zero I face at zero inet DHCP that way it gets a response from the DHCP server and knows to hey it's time to wake up and do some work here I'm gonna go ahead and do service networking restart and we should go ahead and pick up an IP address here okay and we did we picked up an IP so we're good there okay so now that we got the net over here uh, you know what I know y'all probably having an issue with that little box down there seeing me, so I'm gonna switch this over real quick. This and drop it over here, or drag over there, whatever. Okay, so it looks a little better for y'all. Okay, so we got our internet rocking over there. Now what we're gonna go ahead and do is we are going to create a folder to mount the drive to to proceed with the deep bootstrap installation of Dev One. So I'm going to go ahead and type in mkdir uh, forward slash. I'm just going to name it dev1. Nice and simple. And let me go ahead and do an fdis again because I forgot what it was. Okay, uh, yeah, VDA because it's you know virtual machine. So now we're going to have to go ahead and partition this drive and get it ready to mount to that folder we just created so that we can de-bootstrap into that directory, which should actually be, in fact, the drive or the partition. So to do that, go ahead and type in parted dev VDA. I personally am going to want this to be an EFI. So we are going to be doing a FAT32 for the boot partition. And you want to leave a little bit of free space for those first starting sectors. So let's go ahead and get this label on here. So MK label GPT. Well, I don't know why they say it to label because you're actually formatting the, I don't know. Devs have their reasons for things. So MK label GPT and then P for print. Okay, so now you see partition label. It's a GPT partition scheme. And I'm gonna do MK part boot for the boot partition. Uh, let's skip like two. So I'm gonna go ahead and start at two. And I'm gonna leave about, uh, what a gig a gig of space for the boot partition so two through 1000 and then mk part i got 16 gigs on this so for what i'm doing i'm not even going to need a swap you know so i'm not even going to bother with doing the swap we're just going to make this easier y'all are going to do that too anyway so mk part root fs and i'm gonna start a thousand because that's where i ended at before and dash one i'll use the rest of the space of the drive and then we're going to make want to make that first partition bootable so set one boot on and then p for print let's confirm everything's the way we want it okay so start 2096 and thousand megabytes it's a gig and then we're using our to drive space here so that's perfect so you for quit okay so now let's go ahead and do mkfs dot bfat dash f 32 for fat 32 and then slash dev bda bda1 because that's the first uh, partition we made for the boot 
So we're formatting that boot partition now with the FAT32, which is required for EFI booting. He actually is like, I think what, like two different FAT schemes? I don't know. Anyway, so enter. It worked. And then we're going to want to go ahead and get that second partition for the root file system. So we're going to keep it simple and stick with ext4. So mkfs.ext4 dev dda2. And just to confirm everything's good to go, parted dev dda p for print. Got our first partitions, FAT32 file system, second partition, ext4, root fs. We're good. So we're going to go ahead and put out of that. Okay, so now onto the mount team. We're going to go ahead and mount dev bda2. And let's go ahead and mount that over to the dev1 folder. Okay, we have a confirmed mount on the dev1 folder. Okay, so I cleared out the screen here. Um, now we need to go ahead and mount the proc, the sys, and the dev. We need to mount it over to that dev1 folder that we did this uh, debootstrap installation to. And we mounted that partition there, so now we just need to finish the rest. So mount arbine proc dev1 proc. Now there's a few way different methods of mounting this. Sometimes I do arbine, sometimes I do type. Um, this way, I believe, works best for me, so this is the way I do it. So, uh, then we do sys, and now let's go ahead and do dev. Okay, cool. And we're going to go ahead and do a chroot on that dev1 folder now. So chroot dev1. And let's go ahead and mount that boot partition we made. So mount dev bda1 dev dev1. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, we're already chroot. So mount dev bda1 boot. Okay. Clear that out. So. Now what we need to do is we need to go nano to make sure we're going to get the internet here. ETC network interfaces. Okay, so I had this a second ago, but something happened with the camera, so I had to do this part again. But what you're going to want to do is you're going to make sure you have the net set up properly. So you're going to make sure uh, your DNS and your interfaces configuration is right. So I did auto at zero here, I face at zero inet DHCP. That way it gets a DHCP release from the DHCP server. So that's correct. And then now ETC resolve. And just make sure your DNS is right. A lot of times if you don't know it, you just use Google's, which would be 8.8.8.8. .8 so IT, and for the secondary, you can go ahead and use like 1.1.1.1, or you can do like 8.8.4.4. And then just do a ping test to Google to confirm you got internet. So right now I don't, and that's because I didn't restart um, my networking service. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So service, networking, restart. Okay, so as you can see, I got an IP address. Now let's go ahead and do another ping test to make sure at net. Okay, so we got net, and we're good to go. So now that we're at this point in the process, we have the dev1 OS debootstrap installed to that dev1 folder. Now would be the best thing to do next. So we're still missing FSAB, we're still missing the grub installation, and we're still missing the kernel. So I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. Um, let's go ahead and do the FSTAB next. So and clear this out. So I'm going to do a trick here. Let's go ahead and do blkid and then pipe it out to grep and then 
after I piped it out to grip, I'm going to search for VDA and then push that over into ETC F stab. Press enter. And then we'll go ahead and nano ETC F stab. Okay. And go ahead and full screen this here. Okay, so as you can see, I put those two partitions in here. I just do the BLK ID and then push it over with a grep to put the partitions that I want in there. Just save some time so you have to go back and forth, copy and paste the UID and et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a little trick I And now I'm going to go ahead over here and go root and boot. So root is the ext4 partition and boot would be the vfat. And I'm going to go ahead and we're going to keep the UUIDs only. So keep the UUID there and go up here. Go ahead and get every rid of everything for the UUID. So you have the two UUIDs. So now the next would be let's put in the mount point there. And then the partition type would be ext4. And then the options so I like to do no A time, no DIR A time. So instead of default, since I put that just keeps everything from getting time stamped with an updated access time. Helps especially in real time kernel installation environments. Um, so that's good. And then zero and one. So yes for the scan there. And this one's gonna be at boot. And this is going to be a, just gonna put VFAT here. I think you could put fat there too, but I'm not sure. The V fat works fine. It doesn't complain too much about anything. It's, this is good here. Same thing. No A time, no DIR, A time, and zero and two for this one. And we're going to save that. So our F stab is now done and set up and complete. So uh, that's done. I'm going to go ahead and proceed onto the grub installation. So app install, because it's an EFI installation type, we're going to do grub dash EFI. This I want to continue. That should get us all the packages we need for grub EFI installation type. As you're seeing here, you're going to see some message about local. You'll probably set the locals first, but I think even you get to that point, you're going to pull a local error. Um, so another thing we need to do, since we're at this point, we need to do the locals. So we're going to do apt install locals. It still did the grub installation fine. In fact, that won't affect most things. You can probably do this entire installation of that, the locals, but it helps. It, otherwise, certain things won't work. But nano, etc. Um, Local.gen. I'm going to this file here. Oh, wait. You know, etc. Local.gen. Oh, there's nothing there. So let's go ahead. I think we have to generate now. Local gen. Yes. Um. Oh, I didn't put the. E. I was like, huh, I wonder why that's not there. You have to generate it after you choose this part. So we're going to go in here, and these are the locals. So I live in America, so I'm going to do a search for en underscore us. So here's the three us ones. I'm going to go ahead and uncomment these lines. Okay. And now let's go ahead and do a local gen. Local dash gen. 
Just to let you know, this is an uncut video. I'm not really cutting this at all. That way you can see my mistakes, how I handle them, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now onto the grub installation part. So we're gonna go ahead and install grub on that boot partition since we got done with the F-stab and everything. So in order to do that, we're gonna do grub dash install uh, dev vda1 dash dash efi dash directory equals sports slash boot. And then we'll go ahead and hit enter here. Installing, install to no errors finished. So you got the EFI installed in the boot partition. And to confirm that, we're going to go CD slash boot. And you'll see EFI and grub. Clear that out. Now let's make sure that... Uh... Sorry, I got a message here. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and proceed to... I don't know, it would be good to do now. Let's go ahead and do let's go ahead and do the kernel installation. Apt install lineage Linux image generic. Now I think when you do the generic packages, it pulls in some other things like maybe app armor and a few other things that you might not want. But we're just gonna go ahead and do that. So enter 450 megabytes, you sure? Yeah, let's download it. Okay. So, do an ls boot. So now we have our init rd image, our system map, vm minus image, uh, config. So it looks like we got everything there. Let's set a pass. Pass. The root account, so pass wd root. Okay. Uh, clear this out here. Okay, so now that we're cleared out here, we're going to go ahead and build that grub menu. Now, I know it said detected and blah, 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 and it, it does, what it does is after you do a kernel installation, if you look in this directory, cd etc, uh, ctc kernel, and you look in here, you'll have a post install. These are scripts that are run after you do certain, install certain applications or install the Linux uh, kernel. So a lot of times what I do is a lot of these, sometimes if you have a really custom installation, these will actually mess with what you're doing. So what I like to do is I like to go in there and make another directory called disabled, just move them all out. That way, whenever you're installing a kernel, you don't have a grub automatically generated config and then update, and then your init RAM FS update automatically coming in and update. And I like to do things more manual. And I, sometimes like if you have a completely custom kernel and you're doing a few extra things on the side, those can mess you up pretty bad. And especially in the BSDs, uh, they kind of don't, they don't do stuff like this. And a lot of, and some other distributions, they don't, they try to do this to be friendly and helpful for you, but I think it actually kind of, kind of messes you up in a way. Cause if you're doing, you know, Debian and other distros like that. You should honestly know how to build your init RAM FS and compile a custom kernel and stuff already. So anyway, what I like to do is sometimes I like to put those in disabled folders and uh, to make sure that grub menu got configured correctly, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to type in grub dash mkconfig dash o boot grub grub dot, I like to call it grub dot cfg. So uh, mk grub dash mk we did grub dash mkconfig dash o boot grub grub dot cfg okay and you're going to want to make sure that your boot partition is mounted for you run this 
Okay, so it found the image. Everything's slotted to die. Let's go ahead and reboot. Exit. Reboot. As you can see, the grub menu pop right up here, and it's booting. Starting an app armor, yeah. I think that's pulled in by the Linux image generic. And as you see, we're done. That was it. You have your Devon OS installation. As you see, it wasn't that hard. What is this video like? What probably like 30 minutes long or around there? See, it wasn't that hard. We're at the login prompt already. We actually have the full Devon OS on there, complete custom CLI install. So let's go ahead and log in root. I'm trying my password. And so if y'all thought that video was helpful on how to do a de-bootstrap installation of either DevOne, Debian, or a few other uh, distros out there, uh, like and subscribe, support the channel. If you like my work, uh, if you have any ideas or thoughts or comments, or uh, maybe I need to do something differently, or maybe I should probably keep a cleaner desk. Uh, I do need it. Then like and subscribe. So, um, yeah, and let's go ahead and get this community started. So uh, if y'all have noticed, y'all can check out my website here. Uh, let me go ahead and pull it over here. It is fixapc.net. All the tutorials I do will be posted here. I also news aggregate a lot of news. And so things I think are important. Uh, I link to them here, uh, put a small snippet of their content, and then link back to their site. Obviously, I don't want to push too hard on that copyright barrier. So, so yeah, guys, like and subscribe. Out.